Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> give this man a standing ovation. Thank you very much. Oh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President of the Fabric College Student Union, Mr. Chief Justice of the Fabric College Student Union, the team from the Anti Corruption Commission, led by Mr. Patrick Sandy and his deputy, other staff of the commission, all leaders of Fabri College who are here present, all staff and students of Fabri College. I greet you all. It's a distinct honor always to come back to Fabri College in whatever capacity. Because I remember my time here very much and we had some great times. I know exactly what student life is and I know how sometimes the joys that come with it, but also the challenges that go with them. And all of you seated here can already consider yourselves very lucky to be on the path of becoming responsible citizens in Sierra Leone. When some of us were here not too long from now, we never thought or knew who would become down the line. These distinguished gentlemen and ourselves ate our dry rice and uh, butter very comfortably at Block A. We never knew where life was going to take us. Sipia Sadin, you know Sipia Sadin? <laughs> My friend, we would eat Sipia Sadin at 2 a.m. in the morning. And some people will join in because they knew the distinct smell of Sipia Sardine and they will come from all the way to come to your room just to have a taste of it. But we all agree now, looking back, that those were great times. And I'm inviting all of you, despite the challenges of being students, to leave it. We were part of everything. We were part of the politics. We were part of the student union game. We were part of the clubs, the parties, we were part of the fights, the problems and challenges, and we were also part of the relationships, boys and girls, and they were all great. <laughs> never hesitate to indulge when you are in college. You may never have that time again. But today I am here for a more serious reason. To have a conversation with you, and I want this to be a conversation on the law. But I'm not here to teach the law. I'm here to get you thinking around the law as an instrument of change. To show you how we can use the law to change the story of Sierra Leone, because believe it or not, Many of you sitting down here are going to be instruments of change, whether good or bad. And at the center of that change is mankind's greatest invention, the law. Thomas Hobbes in Levitia, 1660, said, without law, man's life was short, solitary, poor, nasty, and brutish. So some people presented that when man is separated from law, his life is 
solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It was a jungle. Those of you who love to watch Animal Planet like I do, if you watch the behavior of animals, you can see that mankind was no different from that when there is law. The lion sees the elephant, the only thing he sees is food. I have to eat. And he's ready to jump. And every other animal behaves like that. There is no law. That is what separates us from the jungle. In fact, in the era of the Atropocene, the Atropocene is the era we are in. Mankind has never always been the dominant factor in the life of planet Earth. In fact, mankind is one of the most recent introduction when it comes to species on Earth. So at various stages of the development of planet Earth, there have been other animals who have dominated. And I'm sure you've already heard this. There was a time when the dinosaurs were dominating. Not so. They were the rulers of the earth. They decided what happened. At that time, mankind did not exist. Through a complex process of evolution, mankind was introduced just about 800,000 years ago in different forms. Starting from the neonatal, the Homo erectus, the Homo sapiens sapiens. We are the Homo sapiens sapiens. We sitting in this room are the Homo sapiens sapiens. And what does Homo sapiens mean? What does Homo sapiens mean? The upright man, no, that is the Homo erectus. Okay, calm down, calm down. Let's hear the lady. What is the Homo sapiens? The wise man. The wise man. The difference between us, the neonatal, the, 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 the Homo erectus was that the brain. It is our brain that became most useful to us. So Homo sapiens means the wise man. Homo means man. Sapiens means wise. But it's called Homo sapiens sapiens. Whenever you see a Latin, a word is repeated in Latin. When you hear sapiens sapiens, the same word repeated, it is for emphasis. It is to confirm how wise you are. So it's the wise wise man. And it is our intellect that separates us from animals. But the introduction of mankind, which started the era of the Anthropocene, which we are in today, ushered in one of the most destructive eras of the existence of planet Earth. We humans are dangerous. The human is the most dangerous introduction on planet Earth. In fact, some people believe that the planet was fine before mankind was created. And one of the ways we have been able to subdue the earth, to conquer, to produce, to design, to inflict, has been the use of our intellect. And that is why the same hub which has introduced you earlier was of the view that the man is selfish, wicked, and cannot be trusted. The human being is selfish in his natural state. When he has not been introduced to anything like law, the human being is selfish, is wicked, and cannot be trusted. That is how we are, all of us. And you can test that in here. If they close that door and they squeeze out the oxygen out of this room and we are sitting down and you look in that corner, one person falls down. You look in that corner, one person falls down. You look here, one person falls down. And you see somebody standing there and nobody has fallen down. To occupy that space 
Some people will cut off another person's head to start there. In this room now, as we are here, whether they are born again, whether they are the most pious and religious, when that time comes for their survival, I am telling you, all of you sitting here will be surprised what you can do. That is the man. Therefore, the only reason why human existence in the age of the Anthropocene has become separate and distinct is because the human mind and intellect developed something called the law. And this law that was introduced was used to create organized living within a system of government. To particularly address this issue where the man in his natural state is violent and brutal. Violent and brutal. We are not different from the lion who sees the elephant and the only thing it is looking forward to is to jump and cut its throat and kill it and eat it for food. So, mankind's biggest invention became the law. And we use the law to organize ourselves. That is why when I was coming in the car, there's an argument happening now in, Nigeria, in, in the US. Somebody is about to be killed. Has anybody followed that argument? Somebody is about to be killed by nitrogen gas. He was sentenced over 20 years ago. And he has been kept in custody. They just woke up one morning. They said, ah, this man is enjoying that prison. Let's now kill him. And two years ago, they took him and injected lethal injection in his system. He didn't die. Some people are, God knows whatever they are made of. The man just did not die. So they went back and invented a way to kill him. And they now said, we are not going to worry with you. We are just going to put you in the simple chambers and we pump nitrogen gas in there until you die. And if you don't die, we are going to find another way to kill you. <laughs> if you are not listening to that argument when you leave here, put your radio or listen to BBC because it's the most thing that the Americans are preoccupying themselves about. This is mankind finding a way to kill his fellow man. But he himself had already killed people before. And they said they cannot forgive him. Law, therefore, has become mankind's biggest invention to do everything he does. Whether it is legal or illegal. The law was created to create a system whereby things can be done orderly. If we have to kill somebody, let us kill him according to law. If we have to get rich, let us get rich according to law. We create a system whereby nobody can take advantage of all of us and we can live and survive. And therefore the law, the very law created kings. He created leaders. And these leaders become powerful instruments of what? Executing the law, not so. So who created the other? Was it law that created kings or it was kings that created laws? Who created the other? Was it kings that created law or law created kings? Kings created laws. I think from what I hear, the consensus is that kings created laws. Not so. So again, that validates the fact that it came from what the human mind, the homo sapiens, he sat down and designed it. Therefore, being king means you are a tool of the law to continuously use in showing its majesty. Even if that means a slice of you should go when you are found wanting. 
And to this end, Emmanuel Kent or Kent Augustine once said, The code of the Hammurabi 1750 BC crafted to govern the first Babylonian Empire, it codified the supremacy of the law. Its punishments may seem draconian today, but it was still original in putting forth the idea that no one, not even the ruler, was above the law. There was a limit on the power of the state, even on the king himself. That is how the law was made majestic. That is how the law was made lofty. That is how the law was made to overtake the person who created it. But is that so? Do you believe that the law overtook the person who created it? Do you believe that the law overtook the person who created it? The law is to be supreme. The law implication or the implication of law is that policies well designed to improve the human being must be done fairly. This way the law becomes the equestrian direction, the horse with his reins and not the reverse. So the whole law should be our touchlight. It should be the one taking us from place to place, telling us what to do. Until the law is made supreme, until the law is made supreme, humankind is no worse than living in the jungle. We may think we are better, but there will be what? Predators and prey. Not so. And that is why some of you say that what? The law applies to some and not to others. Not so. So whenever we say these things, we are basically saying we want the law to apply to all of us. And this is why laws have to be crafted to govern human conduct in a way that reflects the problem that the human being has and the solutions that should solve it. So in 2008, 18, when I was appointed commissioner, we know that corruption is a problem, not so, a serious one. In fact, it is one of those referred to as wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that the solution to them are sometimes unknown or they are difficult to find. So corruption is a wicked problem. Solutions to wicked problems are sometimes not, do, not direct. They can be oblique. But we all know that in Sierra Leone, one thing we have to do is to make sure we apply the law in a way that we change the way our society exists. Because, after all, we are homo sapiens. If the law has not served its purpose in Sierra Leone, then we have to take a step back and ask ourselves what we can do to change this. Because the idea of the law which the homo sapiens brought was to make society better. For us to govern ourselves. For us to not eat ourselves. For you not to convert the other man's property. For you to be able to live in harmony with the other man. For you to live within the framework of governance and leadership. For you to follow rules and apply them. But laws in the hands of those who make them can sometimes become an instrument of oppression. As a matter of fact, many believe that all these things I have told you about the reasons why the law was created is a facade. The law was made to protect kings. And in the protection of kings, it was made to oppress or sometimes keep those who are not kings in order. So, when A.V. Dicey or Baron de Montesquieu and others were talking about supremacy of the law, separation of powers, and all these ideas we are trying to say, at the end of the day, it did not help mankind much. We in Sierra Leone have to understand that we have to help ourselves. Our society has not attained the optimum that we would want. 
the instrument of the law, the majestic power of the law, has not succeeded much to change our lives. We struggle with the basic things that the world has forgotten. How many people slept under electricity last night? But I know that a large portion of our country sleeps in darkness in the 21st century. Water supply is a challenge. I have to dig a well in my compound. A well. In the 21st century, I have a well <laughs> to provide water. It does not mean that we are not doing things to advance, but we are not advancing fast enough. The age of mankind in the age of the Anthropocene is less than 100 years. 100 years, when it comes to the life of the planet, is like nothing. You can't, it's so microscopic, you can't see it. All of us sitting here will be dead 100 years from now. So the question we should ask ourselves is, are we going to use the law to change the story of Sierra Leone? Or are we going to leave it as it is? That is why law reform is very important. That is why we look at ourselves and decide to change things. That is why in 2019 we amended the Anti-Corruption Act to strengthen its powers so that we can address one of the major problems that Sierra Leone is facing, the fight against corruption. We strengthen the powers of the law. I remember when that amendment was postponed, it was war, it was battle. Some people never wanted it to come into effect. It was ambushed in Parliament. It was ambushed in articles. We had to battle it out amongst ourselves. Even the version that now is considered in Africa as one of the strongest anti-corruption laws is the watered-down version. Because when we got to Parliament, the parliamentarians said we will never pass this law. Many people were challenging its powers. But society has to design things that work for them. And we can only do that when we do certain things to meet us. I have argued, and I, 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 in, a, in, a, in a previous lecture that I did at Mitimagai College, or Mitimagai Technical University, my argument or thesis in that lecture was that the rule of law is what we put in the law. The rule of law is not what somebody tells us is the rule of law. So the rule of law in Saudi Arabia is not the rule of law in the U.S. In Saudi Arabia, they say, when you steal, they should cut your hand. In China, they say, for corruption, they should cut your head. If you apply the typical westernized rule of law, of law, of law principle, will you say there is rule of law in China? But the content of the law is designed by mankind. And first of all, we have to resist this, this, this predetermined framework that we have been given, which you are taught in law schools. And that is to say, the rule of law has certain fundamentals, and it is only these fundamentals that are the panacea. The rule of law is the rules that you put in the law. Therefore, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen and students, we in Sierra Leone have to continue to use the law as an instrument of change. To tell or make what we have to reflect what can change our society, not what is dictated to us by someone or some other people by merely replicating what they believe worked for them. The English legal system has existed for so long. By the time we go to 1215, the Magna Carta, and come to now, and you look at the earlier we started somewhere in 1961. And they are the ones who have to tell us what our rules should be, what our laws should be. It may not work for us. So as we continue to teach in law schools, we continue to refer to all these archaic principles. Some of them may have been designed by some drunk judge. And we refer to them so proudly. 
and educate our children to believe that they are the panacea. They are not working for us. Our judges have to be willing to interpret the laws based on our own intellect and understanding of how human relationships will be. Not because of a precedent that was created in 1061 by some drug judge in London. We have to be willing to walk away from the past. We have to reject that which is not of us. We have to put in the laws rules that define who we are to take us to the next level. If not, we are going to continue to be subjugated. Law has always been two things. An instrument of order and an instrument of oppression. For example, now what I'm studying at Harvard is centered around public international law. And one day I was in a class that this professor was teaching and I asked her a simple question. All these rules you are presenting as principles of international law, Jews, cogents, all these things you are talking, they are, their origin is in Christian principles and dictated by English, English understanding of international law as they presented it to the world. So they tell you that all states are equal, but can you really say that all states are equal international law? In the UN, we have what, the P5. Even if the rest of the world agree on everything, five of them can say we do not agree. In fact, one of them. That is an example of the hypocrisy of the law. When it says there is sovereign equality of states, when we all know in our eyes that there is no sovereign equality of states. And these are things we accept without question. The reason why I do these lectures here yeah, is to open your eyes and your minds. I am doing one at the law school tomorrow. And we'll be examining the courts. What really is the rule of the courts? What do judges do? Are they really independent? The courts were created for one reason. Do you know why the courts were created? The king wanted to know everything that is happening in the realm. But the king was too busy sleeping with too many women. He didn't want everybody coming to complain. So he identified people to say, go to this man, go to this woman and complain. When they hear some of them say, this is nonsense. This is how we determine it. This one is not important. The one that is really important, maybe somebody wants to overthrow the state. They come, they say, king, 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 you are sleeping. How many girls are in your room? Somebody wants to overthrow you. And the king will decide whether to just go and sack the entire place, kill everybody. So, the English system created the court as what? A red flag raising institution. It was not for justice. The idea behind setting up courts was never for justice. If anybody tells you that, I am telling you it was never for justice. But tomorrow, we and the law students and the law school will be having a conversation around this. But I'm here to open your minds to think around the law. And that's why I told you I'm not going to teach you law. I'm here to open your minds when you are taught the law to understand that Sierra Leone needs all of you. And that need we have is to start creating our own thinking, our own ideas, so that when we hear these principles as policies of law, we can be able to, to, to curtail them, to design them, to develop them for it to suit our purposes. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I will listen to your questions, but I thank you all.